Um, so I'm Clay Ewing. I'm an associate professor at the University of Miami. Um, I'm the co-director of Nerd Lab, uh, where students and faculty work together on social impact projects that are primarily game-based. Most of the student members of Nerd Lab come from our MFA program in interactive media. Um, so at the School of Communication, we offer a PhD in communication as well. Um, our PhD program has a strong health communication influence, um, so it was only a matter of time before we started working together on evidence-based games for public health. Um, today I'm going to talk about a game I designed and developed with my colleague, Dr. Soyun Kim. Dr. Kim is a health communication researcher, um, and together we worked uh, to integrate theoretical frameworks into gameplay um, in order to change tanning intentions. But before I get to that, I want to step back in time to provide a bit of context for my relationship with measuring impact and how my experience evaluating games has evolved. Okay, so in 2010, I was here uh, in New York at Parsons finishing up my MFA in design and technology. Uh, my thesis project was Hustle in Healthcare, uh, a board game that spoke to the debate about uh, health insurance before the Affordable Care Act had been passed. Um, my feeling at the time was fairly simple. If you presented players with an argument through a system, they would understand it better. Um, and if you use real world data, as I was doing, a player would come away with hard facts as well. Um, and if it was engaging enough, perhaps it could spark a deeper conversation. Um, and the game was play tested thoroughly. Um, I think I saw Eric Zimmerman in the back there who uh, advised me a lot during this process. And I remember the first one that we had uh, at the New York board game designer group was thoroughly trashed. Uh, it was an awful game. Um, but we play tested the hell out of it. Uh, and it finally got to something. Um, and I remember uh, Nick Fortuno uh, coming by after this picture was taken uh, at Playtech and saying something to the effect of, if you can keep four high school students playing your game for two hours in the middle of Playtech, you have succeeded. Um, so that was, that was huge. Um, and if you're not familiar with Playtech, it's an annual event at Parsons uh, where a bunch of kids are brought in to play test a wide variety of games and experiences in development. So it's this huge arcade. Um, so for them to be playing a board game, it was kind of nuts. Um, so Hustle and Healthcare pushed me towards social impact game design as a career. Um, when my partner, Leanne Tran, and I were asked to design a game for the World Bank and the Tanzanian government, it felt like we were moving towards something. Uh, the Tanzanian government had created the Tanzanian Social Action Fund uh, with the objective of enabling poor households to increase incomes and opportunities while improving consumption. The game we designed set out to teach the task of staff about uh, their productive social safety net program. It was well received, and staff suggested that the game could be modified to teach the community about the program as well. So when it was piloted, the game had a debrief that reinforced ideas and concepts, uh, and also asked about engagement and enjoyment. And in certain contexts, this would be a sufficient evaluation. But for the study I'm going to focus on today, the scope is a lot more specific. Um, so the thing that drives me to make social impact games is that they have the possibility of making a difference. Uh, so when Paolo Petrucini commented in 2004 here at G4C, if you can measure it, then it's not the change I want to see. If your gamer technology really works, it freaks me out. <laughs> I, I felt a bit of, yeah, but, you know, because weaponizing games as a propaganda tool is really scary. Um, but just as film and radio continue to be used effectively, um, it's inevitable that games will be used this way as well. So understanding the way in which they can persuade us um, is important, otherwise we're bound to be manipulated. Um, and also, you know, we use film and TV to deliver persuasive arguments for pro-social purposes. Um, if anybody's familiar with Islos High on Hulu, um, it's embedded with educational narratives that promote uh, sexual and reproductive health. Um, so of course it makes sense to do uh, this stuff with games, right? Um, so at the same time that we were developing the game for TASIF, uh, we started working on a tabletop game funded by the Canadian Dermatology Association called Vanity. Um, the game sought to prevent the use of indoor tanning beds, uh, particularly at an early age. We designed the game with a dermatologist as a content expert. Um, so we had no evaluation plan, but as designers, we felt that since we were working with a content expert, um, that would ensure that the game was accurate and provide good information. Um, when we started working with researchers at, at UM, Vanity was selected to evaluate from a health communication perspective. Um, so our preliminary results were promising, but collecting the data has been incredibly slow as the game requires a minimum of three players and more than an hour to play. So 
thinking about positive change uh, mm -hmm. in previous projects, I wanted to make something with a much greater reach. Um, I'd been working on an app with Rock United, if you're familiar with them, on their Diner to Guide uh, for ethical, ethical Eating. And one of the things that struck me most uh, was that restaurant workers didn't receive paid sick days. Um, so following my feeling with hustle, hustle and Healthcare, I sought to create a game that advocated for restaurant workers by allowing them to walk in their shoes for a month, uh, working uh, as a restaurant worker, making minimum wage. But then I'm here at Games for Change again, and during a presentation, Colleen Macklin mentioned this article in Psychology Today. So after... I analyzed the results from this study. I was just made to find that playing the game had no effect on positive feelings toward the poor. In fact, the game had a negative effect on attitudes among certain participants, including some people who were sympathetic to the poor to begin with. So this article is about a game called Spent. Is anybody familiar with Spent? Yeah. So I'm, I'm a big fan of Spent. I, um, I love using it as an example in my design classes. So hearing that a well-designed game had no effect on positive feelings uh, towards the poor was interesting. Um, but the fact that some participants who were sympathetic to the poor beforehand had a negative effect on, on their attitude was really troublesome to me, um, and it freaked me out a bit. Um, and so since that art, uh, Psychology Today article was published, the full study has been published uh, in the journal Cyber Psychology. Um, and as an FYI, one of the takeaways was that playing the game wasn't effective at positive change, but watching someone play it was. Right? Weird. Watching them play it. Watching them play it. Yeah. Um, all right, yeah, cool. Okay, so I think we often have trouble evaluating games because we debate what's considered impact uh, and what it means to properly evaluate a game. Educational games are probably the most straightforward um, as it's pretty easy for the designers and researchers to understand the test results before and after. Increases in test scores would mean that the game's effective at teaching a subject, right? Um, but with games for public health and communication, you're dealing with intentions and attitudes. Uh, so through our work with colleagues on the research side, we're finding that games with a narrative focus uh, seem to align uh, best with theoretical frameworks and communication, as were games that are focused more on play or a different beast entirely. So the games research group in our school came to the conclusion that a tanning intervention game was a good idea, but as a tabletop, requiring multiple players, it was requiring too much time to collect data. Um, okay, so now you have a bit of context from previous stuff. Uh, let's dive right into Dreamy. So it's a single player uh, dating simulator. It's also digital. So it's the first game uh, from the University of Miami School of Communication to be developed with a researcher from day one. We thought it was a great opportunity to match existing theoretical frameworks into uh, the gameplay mechanics. Um, so we chose two behavior prediction models, uh, Fishbane's integrated model of behavioral prediction and Rosenstock's health belief model. The game mechanics target salient beliefs and attitudes to determine behavioral intention to engage in tanning behavior and discourage indoor tanning. The game has nine conversation trees, uh, and it's based on a three by three matrix of character combinations. So outgoing, health conscious, and average paired with their attitude on tanning, anti, neutral, and pro. Uh, and in case you're wondering, the way each potential suitor looks is randomly generated. At the beginning of the game, a friendly guide asks about their gender preference to find matches. Um, they can choose men, women, or say that love has no boundaries. And based on this preference, the game generates the suitor avatars. Once the player starts a conversation with one of these characters, they won't be able to talk to any other characters with tanning beliefs until they fail at the current conversation tree. Um, you might also be wondering how all the characters end up talking about tanning. So as the different characters have specific reasons for tanning and not tanning, we attempted to build conversations that would naturally end up mentioning tanning. There are dead-end characters that never talk about tanning, but the player can never get a date with them. Um, so in early playtests, we allowed uh, people to talk to multiple tanning suitors, um, and the players didn't think this must be a tanning intervention. Um, but we did get people saying, What's what's with all the tanning? This is just weird. Um, so, um, in this example, we have a player talking to a character that's pro tanning. So you can see the potential replies that the player is able uh, to challenge the character's belief with something like, "I don't think tanning beds are supposed to be used like that, or at all." Um, or they can agree with the character, choosing, "I've never thought of a tanning bed as being so corrective. That's smart." Um, so in the game. 
uh, you're invited to visit a tanning salon and improve uh, your physical attractiveness. Um, and when you do this, the player's avatar can even burn. They can tan, they can burn, they can get molds. Um, if they choose to go to the tanning salon, we follow that up with a dermatologist that sends them an offer for a free skin exam. Uh, and then the dermatologist gives them accurate information regarding tanning beds and skin cancer. To win the game, you have to navigate successfully through a character's conversation tree and get a date. Uh, if the date's someone with a tanning history um, or you engaged in tanning behavior, the epilogue changes. There's a series of outcomes for both the player and their love interest that um, include having a brush with death to dying from skin cancer. Okay, so this is what you all want to know, right? What do we find out? Um, our target demographic was young women. And so in that aspect, the game can be said to have a positive impact because it reduced their intent to tan. We tested it against um, a story that was um, like a personal narrative as well as an NIH just uh, facts about skin cancer. And the game was the most effective one at changing women who had never tanned before. Um, it changed their intent to, uh, to use a tanning bed. They also did not enjoy the game. Yeah. Okay. Now, this was the thing that was insane. Uh, men, and then people who have indoor tanned, enjoyed the game. They thought, this is a great game. I love it. Um, and then they, they loved it so much that they wanted to go out and tan after playing the game. <laughs> yeah. So that's the exact opposite of what we wanted, right? Uh, we went really deep on data collection and intervention design. The results that I'm sharing today are from one study, but we have quite a bit more as the research team analyzes all of the data. Um, it's, a problem, it's a problem figuring out exactly what caused that boomerang effect because there's so many variables. Um, there's how many characters they interacted with and which ones they're actually interacting with along with marketing offers that they get, the tanning salon and the dermatologist. To give you an idea of just the suitors in the game, there's 117 specific health um, persuasive messages uh, alone. Okay, so Transportation uh, refers to the feeling of being so absorbed in a story that the connection to the real world is lost for some time. So one assumption that we had for games is that increased transportation is a good thing. Um, but we're not sure about that, um, looking at the results right now. And we need more data, specifically limiting the amount of health me messages that a player receives. Um, also, during the development process of the game, one of our doctoral students, Chun Zhao, decided to use the game for a dissertation. She created a modified version to study interactivity. Um, so in the game, you're able to construct your avatar. She created a version that removed the avatar creation and then streamlined the conversation so that players' choices were predetermined. Um, her initial findings have shown that story-based interactivity is more effective than character-based interactivity. Okay, so after working on Dreamy, I've been thinking a lot about the impact and how we talk about games for change. And Dreamy was definitely impactful. And by playing the game, it will change a person's intent to tan but not always in the right direction. The most important takeaway uh, for me on this is thinking deeply about failure. We tend to celebrate and talk about games that uh, either feel like they're creating an impact or are proven to have impact, but we shy away from telling people about the ones that didn't come out the way that we expected and might have unintended consequences and effects. And I think we need to discuss our failures more. The exciting part for me is that we can iterate and figure out what works. We can analyze the things that didn't work as expected and try to figure out what happened so we don't do it again. Uh, our first step in figuring out the boomerang effect is to simplify the game, and to do this, we're gonna create multiple versions that focus on specific categories. For example, would our results change if we removed all of the pro tanning characters? Or what if the game pushed every player to tan but then had the derm dermatologist intervene? Um, for the designers in the room, how many designers are in the room? Fair number. So uh, you probably know what I'm talking about when saying that working with researchers can set up some hurdles. Um, one of the bigger ones is finding common language. Um, and I found that sometimes envisioning a game through a design brief isn't enough for a researcher to wrap their head around an idea. Um, but prototyping a game just to explain an idea is a big ask of the developers. But it's much easier now to talk about using the skeleton of Dreamy, uh, where players talk to suitors with embedded health messages to think about other possible interventions. Um, so I'm a designer. I'm always happy to talk shop. Uh, although if you're interested in the research side, I'm happy to connect you with my colleagues for further information regarding the nitty gritty. I'm bound to screw it up. I mean, I can tell you what I think is right, but I'll probably screw it up. Um, 
And if you're interested in more information on our MFA program and our lab, the URLs are there. Um, so I think we have time. We have five minutes. All right, we got five minutes. So if there's any questions or comments, fire away. Thank you. Not long-term effects. So it's only their intention. To, so you know, they play the game, and it's like, hey, do you feel like going to a tanning salon? <laughs> right. So narrowing your scope down to avoiding tanning beds versus just avoiding any cause of skin cancer, do yeah. you think that was much more valuable to get the message across, or do you think a broader approach made that uh, So the, the characters do talk about tanning in general. So a lot of the, the beliefs that are targeted are, are more like, oh, my, I look healthier when I have a tan. Right. So, and then they mentioned tanning beds, but it's also implied that they're, you know, tanning. Like it wouldn't matter if they're out in the sun or not. In the back. Can you say a little bit more about like, your strategy for thinking about failure? Um, yeah. And I'm a researcher. I'll yeah. Fess up right away. Sure. And I think when you said you know rethinking, you know what counts as impact. You know you find you have a null result or a negative result or yeah. know, inverse result. You say, well, let's rethink impact. But the fact is, you had there was negative impact, arguably. Yeah. Yeah. So how do you move forward thinking about and learning from that failure from your perspective as a designer? For, from my perspective, I mean, for this game, it's keep keep at it, right? And trying new designs and seeing what happens and seeing if we can just narrow it down to something that's always repeatable. Um, so like if we could, and then, you know, so if we could get it down to this tiny nugget of like a, a game that has messages embedded and then we can change maybe the subject and it still works, then that would be progress to me. Um, you mean like but, minimizing the scope so you get to the yeah. active ingredient and then build from there one step? Yeah, but I think there's, I think a lot of times we end up kind of saying the same thing because we're not sharing where we screwed up, right? Does that make sense? Yeah. So, uh, kudos on embracing your failure and celebrating your failure. It's great. Um, uh, is it possible that, that we running effect could possibly have something? It's possible, um, but we like. I mean, and the I know that uh, my colleagues on the research side would say, but we need to test it, right? Uh, yeah. Um, Would you say a little bit more about the the courage to embrace your failure? And and I'm suspecting that there was some people that said you ought to keep quiet about that. So, uh, well, I don't, okay. So I'll I'll just <coughs> throw this out there. Um, so I'm a I'm you know I'm an academic right I'm at the University of Miami, um, fortunate enough to get a tenure track line, um, and I was just tenured so I was just promoted so I I now have lifetime like a lifetime contract right so I feel like this is a great time to say yeah why not let's let's talk about it and not worry about <laughs> framing it right because um, that's what that's what tenure is supposed to be about is saying things that aren't might be a little uncomfortable. A lot of folks with tenure don't do that. I, I would encourage them to. <laughs> yeah. Can you talk more about the results uh, between the story-based activity and the character-based activity? Yeah. So um, I need to dig more into her dissertation. And I can, I can connect you with her as well. But so what, what it's really driving at is removing agency. Right from the from the game, so and that that really gets it spent too with people watching it, or it's like maybe it's more of seeing somebody do it, but realizing that you can't choose for them, and then seeing another person in that position, it tends to be more persuasive. Why the decision to make it a dating game? Uh, well, so Vanity was about Hollywood, um, and we had this. So the whole thing was how can we talk about tanning and what like what are the beliefs about tanning and a lot of it came to physical um, attractiveness or your just how you look right so then it was well what do we talk about with like why would someone want to look a certain way I was like ooh for auditions like for roles right um, and then one of the researchers said well could we make it more generalizable maybe not everybody wants to be an actor it's like well dating's universal right so let's 
do that because that way you can just talk about it. It just seemed like a natural fit. In the study, there were about 600 and 200 played the game. Yeah. That's the nice thing about digital, right? You put it on Qualtrics and just be like, play. Yeah. Maybe, um, I yeah. There's also genre, and that that's been on my mind too. Um, and maybe the genre of dating games is more popular uh, with men than it is women. Um, so that they went, oh, I, I understand this type of game. Like let me like, I'm gonna do it. And maybe they explored more um, than somebody that was just kind of fucking around. Um, one more. Any more? No, did I exhaust everyone? <laughs> awesome. Well, thank you for your time. I appreciate it.